I would like to welcome you again to uh, an event of the Krasno Global Event Series here at UNC. It is great to see you here in the Mandela Auditorium. Today we are cooperating with UNC Global and the Diplomatic Dialogue, which is run by Ambassador Barbara Stevenson, our Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer. I'm also grateful to NPR, the National Public Radio, for advertising our events. Incidentally, Barbara once was U.S. Consul General in Belfast. It was actually there in Belfast uh, many years ago, I have to say, that we first met. <laughs> it is really nice to welcome, uh, to welcome all of you to our event tonight. I'm Klaus Lars, and I'm the Richard L. Krasner Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I've organized the, organized the Krasner events since 2012, and we are still going strong. As you know, the Krasner event series always deals with issues of global concern in both past and present. As the pandemic has still not been fully overcome, please observe the appropriate caution. Exceptionally, today, we are not streaming the event live via Zoom, but the event video will be available on our YouTube channel after or on May 6, uh, the day after the regional elections in Northern Ireland. And I know all of you will be just jumping to that YouTube channel to see the event once again. <coughs> Unfortunately, we are living in times of war and much international tension. The massive Russian onslaught on eastern Ukraine seems to have just begun. I would like to ask you if you are able to raise and briefly stand up in silence to show respect for the innocent Ukrainian victims of the terrible war and hope that the war will be finished soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Our event today deals with a war and a conflict situation which fortunately, however, has been resolved to a large extent. In modern times, the troubles in Northern Ireland erupted in 1968 and were resolved to a significant extent by the so-called Good Friday Belfast Agreement of 1998. Still, beneath the surface, the conflict in Northern Ireland continues, though luckily much of this conflict now takes place in the political realm rather than by violence in the streets of Belfast, Derry or elsewhere. We are fortunate today that Andrew Elliott the director of the Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington, D.C., will enlighten us about the situation on the island of Ireland. As you may remember, Andrew's predecessor, the late Norman Houston, came to talk to us in 2019 and also gave a great talk. So it's a great pleasure to have Norman's uh, successor here with us today. We also had a number of Irish ambassadors to enlighten us in the past. In fact, our very first speaker in September 2012 was the ambassador of Ireland, Michael Collins. And he actually talked in this very room, at this very podium. <laughs> the Northern Ireland Bureau in D.C. acts as a diplomatic mission of the Northern Ireland Executive in the United States and Canada and is meant to bolster mutually beneficial economic, educational, cultural and community links on both sides of the Atlantic. As director, Andrew's primary role is to promote a positive picture of Northern Ireland, and we, I'm sure we'll hear about uh, the positive picture today, but don't overdo it, uh, and we'll, uh, he will try to influence American policymakers <coughs> and opinion formers and tell them about the uh, importance and relevance of Northern Ireland today. Andrew is a senior civil servant from County Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. He was appointed to his U.S. diplomatic post in November 2019. He joined the Northern Ireland Civil Service in 1988 and the Senior Civil Service in 2000. His previous diplomatic post was as head of the Office of the Northern Ireland Executive in Brussels from 2015 to 2019, where he had also, where he also had to deal extensively with the consequences and repercussions of Brexit and what that meant for not just the UK but in particular for Northern Ireland. Prior his, uh, to his time in Brussels, Andrew dealt in Belfast with the EU's farm policy for the farmers of Northern Ireland. He also dealt with Northern Irish health policies and from 2000 to 2004 he was secretary to the important Parades Commission and in this position he gave much needed advice on human rights, mediation and peace building. 
Andrew was educated at Queen's University Belfast, where I also once taught many years ago, and he is married with two children. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. It's a really a great pleasure to have you here. Andrew will talk for 30 minutes or so, then Barbara and I will have a brief panel discussion here on stage with Andrew, and we will interrogate him a little and ask him very tough and difficult questions, which he doesn't want to answer, but he will hopefully will still do so. And then, as always, we open it up to questions from you, the audience. If you wish to ask a question, then just raise your hand. Our Krasnow, uh, our excellent student Krasnow assistants will then rush to you with a microphone and ask you to post your question. Please mention your name when asking a question. And as always, we are videotaping our event and it will be available on May 6th. And our YouTube channel is, of course, a famous YouTube channel, youtube.com slash USA. And we also have a mailing list and uh, our Krasnow assistants are uh, passing through uh, the room. If you are not yet on our mailing list, then please uh, sign up. We will not pass on your name and email address to any third parties like the CIA, the FBI, or anything like that. <laughs> we'll just keep it, uh, keep it here. Uh, <coughs> us. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today to our Krasnow Global Event at UNC. And today it is no, uh, uh, Andrew Elliott who will talk about Northern Ireland and the journey to peace and reconciliation, reconciliation the EU factor then and now. Andrew, over to you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I heard there were going to be difficult questions afterwards, so I brought this glass of water for a very long speech. <laughs> it's a great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity uh, for me for the first time to come to North Carolina um, and to join you here in the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, it's a great pleasure in part because I see friendly faces around the room, people I know from uh, various previous encounters and so on, and it just starts to make me feel at home already. I'd particularly like to thank Ambassador Barbara Stevenson and Professor Klaus Norris for the kind invitation to participate in, the, in this uh, prestigious uh, lecture series, this Krasno series, with the goal of enhancing the understanding and comprehension of global affairs past and present. Um, both uh, Barbara and Klaus have long-standing connections with Northern Ireland, which, we, which we've talked about. Um, and I think that is, in a way, reflective of the relationship, the long-standing connections and relationship that there has been uh, between, the, um, between the, the state of North Carolina and Northern Ireland too. Uh, in terms of those historic links, I'm just going to mention a couple of people. In particular, just the other day I was reading about Andrew Johnson, the 17th President of the United States whose grandfather left Larne, County Antrim, around 1750, and who was born in Raleigh. Johnson had a bit of a hard act to follow in the form of Abraham Lincoln, and history generally doesn't rate him that highly as a president, so I'd perhaps better quickly go back a few years and mention um, one James Polk, a president who was born in Pineville, Mecklenburg County, uh, the descendant of one 17th century Robert Pollock from Coleraine uh, on the north co coast of Northern Ireland and who in January 1816 was admitted into this university as the second semester sophomore. As president, Polk was instrumental in reducing tariffs at the border between the United States and Britain. Uh, to the greater benefit of both economies, it has to be added. So his story is perhaps not unrelated to the topic that I'm going to approach uh, this evening. I'm very, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to represent the modern Northern Ireland in the United States and Canada. Despite all the challenges of its history, and indeed its recent history during my lifetime, it's actually a wonderful place to visit, or indeed in which to study, work, invest, or live. The very occasional reference to Northern Ireland in the media here can have a distorting effect on perceptions. So
So, for example, as happened earlier uh, this year, if a gang turns over a bus in Belfast in a political protest, it will quite often frustratingly feed into an eventual headline somewhere in the New York Times or perhaps on MSNBC. Less noted is the fact that Northern Ireland's homicide rate today is about one person per 100,000. So your chances of facing a violent and unpleasant end there are broadly similar uh, to the chances of facing that end in Hampshire, in New Hampshire or Vermont. That's not to say that there aren't problems or risks to the peace process in Northern Ireland, but for a couple of decades now, we have lived a very, in a very peaceful place, and that has made a huge difference to attitudes and to opportunities for economic growth and tourism. We shouldn't, of course, forget what went before, the deaths from what were euphemistically called the Northern Ireland Troubles over the entire period from around 1966 to 2006 are documented in the book Lost Lives. There were 3,712 deaths, which was a massive toll in a small population of one and three quarter million people. And that's without referring at all to the many people who, who were injured or lost people in the, in the Troubles. A big part of the massive change and improvement in circumstances in Northern Ireland in recent decades has resulted, of course, from the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, about which my predecessor spoke uh, when he last appeared here. Um, after many decades of work by many, many people working on a various iterations of a peace process, it was really brokered in the end by the patience and diplomacy of Senator George Mitchell, um, from the United States who had a success in 1998 during the Clinton administration. This massive achievement is testament to the invaluable role that the United States has played in the building of peace in Northern Ireland. Less frequently examined, perhaps, is the role that the European Union and its predecessors played in the process of peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland and indeed which the EU <coughs> continues to play today, even with Northern Ireland now outside the EU. Having lived and worked in Brussels for almost seven years, I have a strong sense of the degree to which the EU considers itself invested in the peace process. So what I propose to do over the next 30 minutes or so is to talk a little bit about the roots of conflict in Northern Ireland and then explore the ways in which the European Union factor contributed to the resolution of that conflict. I'll then go on to explore the departure of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland, from the European Union and the new risks and sometimes opportunities that emerged with that momentous decision. Uh, those risks are, arguably, to some extent, connect the Northern Ireland issue today to a wider geostrategic issue concerning the future of, of Western Europe. A great deal of what I will say revolve around the issue of borders. I have to tell you that I find borders fascinating, and I guess that's in part because I hail from a border area myself, and I grew up being regaled with stories about the border, stories including many funny ones, as well as some incredibly sad stories of grief and loss. My family hails from the border area between counties Fermanagh and Donegal, in an area that was mercifully not that heavily impacted by the Troubles, um, at least not as much as it might have been. So I'm what you might call a creature of the border, having grown up just a couple of miles from a crossing point which I always remember as being marked by twin customs posts, north and south, and through which we had to pass with the wave of the customs office, officer's finger on the way to Donegal Town or the beautiful beaches of Doran or Rosnala. Since coming here to live in the US, I've learned a great deal more about a member of my mother's family, who, from her family tree at least, who in the course of the first half of the last century chose to travel to the US to a new life. One of those stories is worth telling, not just because it is funny, but also because it makes an important point or two about the nature and origins of the conflict that arose in and around Northern Ireland. So last year, I found myself traveling to Southington, Connecticut to meet some elderly relatives. 
They told me about a man called George who, at the end of the 1800s, had been born close to the village of Pettigo in County Donegal, close to the Fermanagh border. It was a piece of family history about which I didn't really know. In all probability, the famous Seamus Heaney line, whatever you say, say nothing, may well have played a role in that. When Ireland was partitioned in 1921, County Donegal found itself in an Irish free state, while County Fermanagh, right next door, found itself in Northern Ireland, which then chose not to remain a part of the Irish free state. A brand new European border had been established, and not the last one. Um, there were many more uh, created in Europe around the same time. Pettigo <coughs> found itself a largely unionist village at the time, located mostly in the free state, whereas a little further south of the lake, a mostly nationalist village found itself in Northern Ireland. Such are the consequences of creating new borders. George, who was in his 20s and from the unionist community around Pettigo, had joined the Ulster Special Constabulary, a new and controversial organisation set up as a kind of reserve police force, just in advance of partition and almost entirely drawn from the unionist community. It found itself quickly in confrontation with the Irish Republican Army during the War of Independence. From the outset, the organisation was heavily criticised by Irish nationalists because it was seen as partisan and sometimes worse. As history would have it, and as a direct result of the partition of the island, this tiny village of Pettigo became the scene of the last ever pitched battle between the IRA and the British Army in 1922, when one Winston Churchill unexpectedly decided to send in the troops. After hearing reports that the IRA had occupied the village of Pettigo, as the IRA withdrew from the village, at least as I was told the story, they came upon George in an isolated house and took him hostage. He was held for six months in an isolated part of Donegal, and my relatives in Connecticut told me a funny story about the situation that developed. It turned out that he and his captors at a certain point ran out of food and there seemed to be no way to resolve the problem. After a bit, George decided to try to find a solution, and he approached his captors with an offer to resolve the hunger problem if they would trust him enough to give him one of their guns. In the end, they gave him the gun, according to the story, and he went out onto the hillside in Donegal, shot a sheep, brought it back, dressed it, and cooked it, and the story went that they lived in splendor for the rest of his time in captivity, at least relative to how things had been before. When I pressed my relatives on this point, it became clear that my relative and his captors knew each other. They were neighbors. <laughs> they were neighbors who had been torn apart by circumstances and a war that confronted them with a need to take sides as to whether they preferred to think of themselves as Irish or as British. A war that involved a border with all the implications that that had for two neighboring counties. I have found myself thinking of George and his captors recently as I've watched developments in Ukraine, particularly in the Donbass, where presumably there are people, some of whom feel they have a Ukrainian identity and some of whom feel they have a Russian identity, and perhaps others who are a mixture of the two, but perhaps now being forced by circumstances to take sides. For several decades after 1922, relations between the two parts of Ireland were not particularly good. The Irish Constitution adopted in 1937 defined the national territory as the entire island of Ireland, something that didn't change until the Good Friday Agreement, and security concerns restricted cross-border travel quite a bit. The border was determined by county boundaries, but it divided other boundaries. It divided parishes, it divided dioceses, transport and market networks, as well as the poor law unions that in those days provided medical and welfare services. There were at that time 180 cross-border roads, but only 16 approved crossing points. Several towns were cut off, from their natural interlands. As a great deal of the challenges associated with EU exit concern trade, 
it's probably helpful to talk about the border a little bit in those terms. The first customs posts were erected in 1923, but barriers to trade remained um, limited until around about the early 1930s when Britain introduced a highly protectionist regime for UK agriculture and a change of government in Dublin at the same time resulted in a program of economic self-sufficiency. By between 1932 and 1936, exports from the north to the south declined by two-thirds. Farmers and food processing plants in border regions were required to pay import duties on agricultural produce. There was an impact on farm incomes, though smuggling emerged as an alternative source of income for the less scrupulous. I remember my father telling me many tales of small-scale smuggling that took place in his youth in what were known as the Hungry Thirties, and which he saw as vital to avoid abject poverty in border communities at the time. Tariffs and quotas continued to impact on cross-border trade, including personal shopping until the late 1960s. And then, of course, there was the issue of the freedom of movement of people. In 1922, the Irish Free State was a dominion in UK terms, and its citizens were British subjects with the right to travel, live and work in the UK. This was curtailed during World War II, an identity card and visitor or work permit was issued by the British authorities at that time. These restrictions were gradually removed after the war, but in response to concerns that immigrants from the South might take jobs from the local population in Northern Ireland, the UK Parliament introduced an order requiring any resident from Ireland to secure a work permit from the Northern Ireland Ministry. A permit system from the devolved administration in Northern Ireland was required until the 1970s, even though the 1948 Nationality <coughs> Act granted Irish citizens the same rights as British citizens in relation to employment and freedom of entry to Great Britain. Again, a set of issues that were tackled and resolved by the Good Friday Agreement. <coughs> And then, of course, there was the issue of the Troubles, which began at the end of the 1960s, and which layered new border requirements of a security kind on top of the customs posts and restricted border crossing points. In some areas, though thankfully not so much in Pedigo, that required the introduction of watchtowers, together with heavily fortified bases, which often jarred with the beautiful natural environment to which they'd often been placed, and certainly jarred with the local population, which more often than not, was nationalist in its inclinations. This was the Northern Irish border context within which political thoughts in London and Dublin were turning to the possibility of membership of the European communities. It's important to think about that recent history in order to appreciate fully just how much change was to follow as a result of that. In Western Europe, after the Second World War, and whilst all this stuff was happening on the island of Ireland, change was afoot with the beginnings of cooperation in Europe in the 1950s. The pioneers of this shift included people who had been resistance fighters in the war, Holocaust survivors, and of course politicians, notably the French politician Jean Monnet, um, who I think um, you're, in your first post, Klaus, you, you, you occupy the post with his, his name and the title, uh, and Robert Schumann, who was born a German citizen in Luxembourg, but who became French and fought in the French resistance during the war. The basic idea that these and other significant European visionaries came up with, with the dawn of the 1950s, was that if control of coal and steel could be shared among a number of countries, then it would be harder for those countries to go to war against each other because coal and steel were both needed for armaments. In the 1960s, the resulting European coal and steel community was brought together with Euratom and the European Economic Community to create the European Communities with a European Commission, a European Council, and an early version of the European Parliament. Initially, there were, of course, only six countries involved. The UK and Ireland were not among those six, but it's worth mentioning some early developments that occurred 
that in my view were absolutely key to the impact the EU would have later in transforming Northern Ireland. One such development took place in 1968 with the beginning of a customs union. The members of the EEC removed customs duties on goods imported from each other allowing free cross-border trade for the first time. They also applied the same duties on goods from outside countries so that there was no need at all to have customs checks anywhere within the EEC. So trade among the six countries as a consequence of this grew rapidly and the EEC became an increasingly interesting proposition for neighbouring countries such as the UK and Ireland. In 1973, the UK and Ireland joined the EEC along with Denmark, increasing the number of countries at that time to nine. There were major economic challenges in the early 70s as a result of energy-related war in the Middle East, as a result of another key development of huge significance for Northern Ireland then, there was in the European Economic Community the establishment of a special fund to transfer money from richer to poorer parts of the EEC. It was called the European Regional Development Fund, or ERDF. And from that, those early beginnings, the ERDF has been a feature in just about every other post I've ever held in the Northern Ireland Civil Service because it's been a really important component of the shifting of funds uh, from the wealthier parts of the European Union to the parts that were, were struggling in Northern Ireland. Um, certainly in those early days had less than 75% of the GDP, uh, of the average GDP in the, in the European economic community. So along with the Common Agricultural Policy and the Economic Social Fund, these, these funds became really had a key role in keeping the economy and society moving until the combination of spillover from economic prosperity in the Republic and the dividends of the peace process began to have a serious impact in a positive way on GDP per capita in the North. Another factor that I consider highly significant was that the first direct elections to the European Parliament took place in 1979. In Northern Ireland, the entire region was treated as a single constituency with the potential to elect three MEPs, members of the European Parliament. This led to the election of two unionists and one nationalist representative and introduced two key figures from Northern Ireland politics to the European um, economic experiment, John Hume and Ian Paisley. And they were there in that role for no less than a quarter of a century, both of them. John Hume was quick to see the relevance of the building of peace in wider Europe to the situation in Ireland. It was clear from his public statements that he saw significant read across uh, from the building of peaceful cooperation between, for example, France and Germany to the resolution, <coughs> resolution of the Irish situation. But I would argue that it was just as important an experience for Ian Paisley, a firebrand unionist, who became familiar with a wider process of European change in relation to borders that would ultimately perhaps make it easier for unionism to come to terms with similar changes on the island of Ireland. Perhaps the biggest and most powerful European change of all took place in 1987 when the Troubles were still at their peak with the introduction of the Single European Act. This piece of legislation established the single European market across Europe. The Conservative Party was in power in the UK at that time under the leadership of one Margaret Thatcher. And it was Thatcher's commissioner, Lord Cockfield, who was responsible for the single market and drew up the initial white paper. For Prime Minister Thatcher, the act represented the realization of Britain's long-standing free trade vision for Europe, moving beyond the tariff-free commitment of the common market. The act would dismantle barriers to intra-community intra trade posed by different national standards and the exclusion of foreign firms from public contracts. The aim was to create a single market bigger than Japan and bigger than the United States. The consequence of this act was huge for borders in Europe because it significantly reduced the importance of internal borders within what later became the European Union. 
and at the same time, it significantly and importantly for the purposes of our discussion, increased the importance of the European Union's external borders, an issue to which I will return. Research shows a strong interrelationship between the establishment of the single market and a reduction in the black market economy around the border in Ireland, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because the changes affected almost all products, so the incentives to smuggle those products were largely removed. Exceptions that remained were in relation to a few products like cigarettes and diesel fuel, but in general, in border areas such as Newry and Derry, the white economy became far more important than the black economy. Over time, potentially important too in reducing the flow of funds to, for example, paramilitary activity. In addition to the creation of a customs union and then a single market for goods that created a more unified economy on the island of Ireland and removed a wide range of reasons for any discernible or visible border in the island. The EU is also a significant investor in Northern Ireland. I mentioned the European Regional De Development Fund, the ERDF, the European Social Fund and the Common Agricultural Policy earlier. During my career, I was at times heavily involved in, the, in their deployment. To give you a sense of their scale, the EU committed three and a half billion euros to Northern Ireland from what came to be known as its structure of funds between 2014 and 2020 very large chunk of this going into agricultural and rural investments. But in addition to the funds that I've already mentioned, some new and significant programs began to be developed that were highly pertinent to the circumstances of Northern Ireland and the border issue in particular. These were the peace funds and a program called Interreg. The first peace funding was committed in 1995, four years before the Good Friday Agreement was made. Recurrent commitments were made recognizing that even though peace had been, in, at least in theory, achieved, there was still a long way to go to deal with some of the consequences of the conflict. During the period between 2014 and 2020, for example, about 270 million euros was committed onto these programs, which were delivered by a special EU programs body, one of six bodies set up on a north-south basis under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. All this funding was greatly welcomed by Northern Ireland politicians from right across the community and, and played a significant role in tackling the many challenges that were being faced by a society and an economy, first of all living through conflict and then later emerging from it. The peace programme had two main aims, cohesion between communities involved in the conflict in Northern Ireland and the border counties of Ireland and wider economic and social stability. It's worth mentioning the Interreg programme briefly too, because unlike the peace programmes, it wasn't unique to Ireland and Northern Ireland, but one of about 60 similar programmes right across the European Union designed to foster cooperation across borders. Challenges to cross-border cooperation can include language barriers, but also historical political differences. So at an EU level, it was seen as a priority to encourage this. In its final years before the UK left the EU, the programme between Northern Ireland and Ireland was extended to include Scotland. There were, of course, many other EU programmes in which Northern Ireland was involved and from which it benefited. For example, in the areas of research and technological development, there was the Horizon programme and in relation to encouraging young people to experience university in other European countries, there was the Erasmus programme. From a northern and southern Irish perspective, particularly in relation to the research and development programmes, what was interesting about these programmes was that they often required the involvement of partners from, say, four or more member states. This meant that if, say, Queen's University Belfast collaborated with Trinity College Dublin at an early stage, they already had two partners at the ready making it easier to reach critical mass and putting in additional partners from other countries. Um, one important point to make at this point was that the UK, as a member state of the European Union, was a net contributor towards its funding. And so there was always the question of how much additional funding might have been available to Northern Ireland direct from Westminster in the absence of EU membership. This question is, of course, now in the course of being answered. 
as the UK begins to announce its own funding to replace EU structural funds across the UK under its own shared prosperity funds. The European framework within which things happened in Northern Ireland enabled an environment where it wasn't so frequently necessary to make choices between a British identity and an Irish identity. The wider European context allowed people freedom to express either identity or both and still fit within the broader European identity. Cross-border working was made easier for unionists because it was happening all over Europe. The contribution of the EU to funding programs and to agriculture and rural development made it easier for parties such as Sinn Féin and the DUP, both of which for different reasons historically had had concerns about the European project, to unite in support of the benefits that they saw coming to local communities. What's not to like? And then came Brexit. I suppose it's fair to say that no one ever really expected the UK to leave the EU. Of course there were lots of voices grumbling about the EU, but even many of those voices thought, probably, that they would lose by a small margin, with Middle England in the end demonstrating its usual pragmatism. When this didn't happen, it came as an enormous shock to just about everyone involved. I was posted in Brussels in the run-up to the referendum and for several years after, and it made for a very interesting uh, intellectual and emotional experience. There's plenty of analysis as to what precisely caused 51.9% of the UK population to vote to leave the EU and 48.1% to vote to remain. But what was really interesting to me, based as I was in Brussels, was the apparent lack of focus on the implications of leaving. At its most extreme, I remember a German commission official, a friend, telling me that one of his British colleagues had voted to leave as a protest vote and was then horrified when he discovered the implications for his career and the outcome. A number of particular points struck me during the months of negotiation and sometimes the antagonistic public positions that were taken up. The first was that the power of the European Union, and especially the Commission in matters of trade, seemed not to be fully appreciated in London, perhaps because that power had been ceded many years before, and therefore the expertise no longer sufficiently resided in London. Secondly, the huge importance that Margaret Thatcher had attached to the development of a single market was no longer quite so evident in Westminster. There was a sense that the importance of the trading relationship between, say, Germany and Britain would take precedence over commitments to the single market. Even though, while I was in Brussels, the German car manufacturers and others were coming there to make speeches indicating that their top priority would always be protecting the single market. Thirdly, there were plenty of people in Brussels with a deep appreciation of the peace process in Northern Ireland and also plenty of people in Brussels with a good appreciation of the trade and other implications of Brexit, but they were not, at least initially, the same people. And this was a very important development that needed to happen really, really quickly, was that ability to pull together two sets of expertise to be able to properly understand the implications in the, in the particular context of Northern Ireland. It was identified early on that the decision to leave the EU created a new risk in relation to the peace process, and that a decision to have what became known as a hard exit in particular would create significant pressures on the island of Ireland. This was because the single market had, as I said, reduced the importance of internal EU borders but magnified the importance of external borders around that single market. In fact, the essence of the success of the laborious work to create a single market depended on every country with an external border playing its part to protect the market. The Irish government, of course, worked hard to ensure that the situation on the island of Ireland would be attended to and were quite effective in that regard. And they, for example, were very successful in ensuring that that issue was resolved in the first phase of negotiations leading to the withdrawal agreement. It was extremely conscious of the sensitivity of the Irish border, and particularly in circumstances where the UK might leave the single market and customs union, the nature of an EU external border that might be needed. 
The European Union, of course, already has an extensive land border, running from the Finland-Russia border in the Arctic Circle to the land border between Turkey and Greece in the south. This entire land border of approximately 10,000 miles, though, has an estimated 137 crossing points. The situation in, in, on the island of Ireland is that there is a 300 mile land border with no less than 275 crossing points at the last point that I saw. There was and is an intimacy about the Irish border that made it particularly unsuitable for a single market frontier. So discussions quickly began to revolve around the possibility of carrying out checks at ports and the convenience that might be associated with that. After several years of frustrating negotiations and a change of government in Westminster, a withdrawal agreement was agreed between the UK and the EU, which involved a protocol specifically relating to the unique circumstances concerning Northern Ireland and the Irish border. This entered into force on the 1st of February 2020. In addition to leaving the EU itself, the withdrawal agreement and the subsequent trade continuity agreement provided for the UK indeed to leave both the customs union and the single market. This meant a more severe kind of external border arrangement than, for example, the arrangement between Norway and the EU, or between Switzerland and the EU, two countries which are part of the single market, though not the customs union. The driver behind this for the UK was a desire not to be bound by EU regulations, but to be free to make its own way in the world without needing to follow, for example, European requirements on food safety or state aid restraints unless it wished to itself. For completeness, the withdrawal agreement also covered citizens' rights and financial settlement, a transition period, governance arrangements, and protocols in relation to Gibraltar and Cyprus and some other separation issues. Turning specifically to the Northern Ireland Protocol, provision was made for no hard border on the island of Ireland, no diminution of rights set out in the Good Friday Agreement, and protection of the All-Ireland economy. Key features of the Protocol include that the UK will continue to facilitate the work of human rights and equality bodies in Northern Ireland, that the common travel area between the UK and Ireland will continue, that Northern Ireland is part of the UK customs territory so that it is included in UK trade deals, but that the EU customs code applies to Northern Ireland as well as EU rules concerning the movement of goods, that EU laws pertaining to the single electricity market on the island of Ireland continue to apply in Northern Ireland. Essentially, Northern Ireland for most practical purposes remains part of the EU single market for goods, though not for services. The withdrawal agreement also provides for the European Union to continue to contribute to peace and interreg funding between Ireland and Northern Ireland, securing the future for this iconic contribution to Northern Ireland's process of peace and reconciliation. A key feature of this agreement that has caused significant concern for unionists participating in the current elections to the Northern Ireland Assembly is that the implementation of the protocol has caused major changes in relation to the movement of goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. There is, as might be expected, at the frontier of the single market, a significant burden of red tape, and this is exacerbated by the particular nature of the way in which goods move from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, compared, for example, with how goods from third countries might arrive in the port of Rotterdam. On the other hand, the protocol does provide a unique access for goods from Northern Ireland to enter both the UK and the EU market in a way that is unfettered by checks. And this is creating significant interest from businesses in other jurisdictions who wish to continue to have easy access to both markets at the same time. These issues are, right now, part of the meat and drink of the election campaign to the Northern Ireland Assembly. The economies of the two islands were so closely intertwined for so many years that of course having to find a place for a customs union boundary and perhaps even more challenging a single market boundary was bound to be a huge issue. During my time in Brussels I spent a significant amount of time cultivating relationships with the Swiss, the Norwegians, the Icelandics and the, and the Liechtenstein ambassador 
as I didn't expect that the UK would separate itself quite so much as it in the end did from the single market. That investment wasn't lost, however, as the protocol relating to Northern Ireland brought a closeness in order to resolve the Irish land border problem that meant there was a great deal to be learned uh, from our engagements in Bern and Geneva in particular. It's widely known that Invest Northern Ireland has experienced a high level of interest from external businesses, particular, particularly multinationals, interested not to miss out on the opportunities that could be associated with that unique level of access to two markets. None of the parties on the executive will want to lose out on inward investment opportunities, but there is a question in the minds of some parties about the challenges that are being faced in the Irish Sea as a result of the checks at the ports. On the other hand, Brexit has also brought hard choices, and some of these have until now been masked by grace periods both for Great Britain and for Northern Ireland. Depending on the UK and the EU approach to ongoing negotiations about the implementation of the protocol, the impacts of some of the more difficult aspects of the particular Brexit that was negotiated could become more evident as we move through this year and, and beyond. There is a particular burden of checks associated with the movement of animal and plant products, and I expect that finding a better agreement between the EU and the UK on this will be particularly important and valuable. The good news is that it can be done, but it does require the political will to be there to find solutions. The wider risks that attend to Brexit for both parties to the exit agreement are significant, so nothing can be taken for granted at this point. I am, however, an optimist about the future, notwithstanding all the concerns that are being expressed at present. In a sense, Brexit is a test of the resilience of the Good Friday Agreement. There is, of course, a risk. One of them is that journalism or social media continues to paint a picture of the old Northern Ireland, something based on an old model that has actually changed without recognising the scale of the change that is already there, and that a more multi-dimensional understanding of politics in Northern Ireland than the simplistic divide between two communities could then become delayed. People in both communities can sometimes even today be bleak about the value of the executive and the assembly and there is no doubt that when these institutes, institutions are not working effectively for long periods it takes its toll on voter confidence. But there are indicators that people are taking a wider issue, a range of issues into account in how they vote and this is likely to create change in the future. I spoke at the start about the, the low murder rate in Northern Ireland. For most of the past year, outside observers have predicted that violence might increase in the run-up to the election, but it largely didn't happen. There's also, for example, at the moment, a remarkably low unemployment rate. And of course, the gap in employment opportunities between Catholics and Protestants that used to be a key concern, for example, here in America, is almost entirely gone, both in terms of access to jobs in general and in terms of access to top jobs. This is welcome, and according to research from Queen's University Belfast, is per perhaps the only place in the world where such a gap in access to employment between two different groups has been so successfully tackled. The economy of Northern Ireland is continuing to develop in new and exciting directions. There have been huge challenges associated with the pandemic and also with the adjustments that continue to be needed as a result of Brexit. But the growth of excellence, and including global excellence in areas such as cybersecurity, fintech and advanced manufacturing, continues apace. And there is a creativity at work that can be seen, especially in the film sector, with sightings of top film stars in central Belfast now a really regular feature of life. The harsh reality is that things have changed fundamentally and there is simply no appetite for a return to violence. Rather, there is a sense that these things can be sorted out through political engagement. And the politicians all know each other well as a result of many years of working the institutions. That human factor is impossible to ignore when compared with the late 1980s when they really didn't know each other at all other than as enemies. So hopefully my optimism for the future is not entirely misplaced, only time will tell. I'll pass back to you now, Lars, uh, uh, because I'm very happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And Barbara came and sat in the right place. Thank you very much for a very interesting, illuminating talk. You certainly sold Northern Ireland to the world. And that seems to be the place to go, both for murder rates and uh, unemployment uh, figures. Very good. Um, thank you for uh, talking to us about the implications of Brexit and how they can be dangerous, but also can be overcome. Um, maybe we go back a little bit into the past and tell us more how uh, it was possible for such an ingrained conflict in modern times, as I said, since 1968, but really hundreds of years, the Irish and the Brits and the Irish and the Irish have been at loggerheads. And then suddenly in the 1990s, that was overcome. A, tell us how that was, how that happened. And secondly, is there a lesson to be learned when you look at the current war uh, in Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine? Can we, you know, learn from Northern Ireland how to mediate some solution, or do you think these are totally different uh, conflicts which have little with each other? Okay, so I, th I think first of all that sometimes uh, it is possible in, in history to catch a wave, uh, and there are cycles in any conflict. Uh, there are times when people are not ready uh, to resolve issues, but they're not ready to discuss anything, they're not really ready to compromise. And there are other times when a confidence of events can mean that they are. And I think what happened during the peace process was that a few of the right people came together and managed to catch a wave and, and bring success out of that wave. It doesn't always happen. And I think it created a huge sense of responsibility on everyone then who had inherited the peace to try to make sure that that really wasn't wasted. So even though they have very challenging and intense political debates and discussions, including about the Constitution and so on, still, that there is a sense of um, huge relief uh, and, and, and the desire to make sure that, that it carries on. In relation to the question about the application of the, the, uh, the, the lessons from the conflict to other places, I think with care there is huge application. I have a view that Basically, conflict everywhere in the world is caused by some basic human frailties that are pretty much the same everywhere, and it's about how people view each other, how people like to, to think of the world in terms of us and lemons and so on. And so I think there are some broad principles that are highly relevant, I think, um, in, 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 in the Ukrainian situation. The question in my mind it might be about, well, when, when is the right time to try to think about peace and quite often it's not right after the, the, the war has just started so it, 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 and, I, and I wouldn't really want to comment too much on a situation I don't know too much about except to say that if, if people are indeed being driven into their sort of separate identities in a very intense way potentially as a result of the violence that's going on in Ukraine then the seeds of the solution will have to be along the lines of the kinds of strands that emerged from the work on the Good Friday Agreement, that idea about looking inside Ukraine and the kind of country that Ukraine wants to be, that idea about then looking towards your next door neighbours, but both Russia and Europe, and seeing what the, um, the aspects of those relationships are that could play into a more peaceful solution for Ukraine. But it would be very difficult to go beyond that and saying, yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding Northern Ireland, so the EU and the US were absolutely essential for the peace process to uh, to come to fruition, or were they not that essential? I, I think if you look at the peace, that, and, and certainly what I was saying in my, in, in my talk was that the, the process was a long one. An awful lot of the really important work that was done was not done right at the very end, though that was important and really important as well, but there was work done all along the way. Uh, the use of those funds to build capacity in communities to enable people to engage and talk to each other in ways that perhaps hadn't been happening and so on. So there was a great deal of really important stuff that went on to which the European Union contributed. And then I think the ongoing interest of a powerful neighbor across the sea, across the ocean, like the United States, was also a critical moment to try to keep focus on, on finding a resolution. So I think in different ways, both the EU and the 
U.S. were involved, you will find your own way to the solution that we find. Okay, thank you. Barbara, you want to ask something about the current developments, I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to ask you very hard questions, Andrew. Ask this happening. I'll, I'll be up to do that. Um, let's talk about the future. You, you've done a great job of presenting the, the status quo. It's, it's quite a good situation for Northern Ireland because it can export without uh, any constraints into both the UK and the EU. So well done on driving that point home. Is it tenable over the long term to leave a border in the Irish Sea, or is it uh, an issue that is going to just beg for resolution? So you won't be able to comment on that in the run up to the elections. Let me ask you then a, just a factual question. What do current public opinion polls say about thinking in Northern Ireland about preference to remain in the UK or join the Republic of Ireland? What's polling showing us? So the polling is is saying that the way in which people vote in assembly elections, for example, whether they vote for nationalist or unionist parties, isn't necessarily reflective of the way that they would vote in the event that there was a vote on a united Ireland or remain in the United Kingdom. Um, I, I think it, it's 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 easy to, to, to interpret polls in too simplistic a way and a lot in terms of how people actually vote might depend on how sensitive or sensitized people are feeling at the time of that vote. But I think broadly speaking, it does seem to me that at the present time the polls are signaling that people would on balance vote to remain in the UK if there were a poll in the near future. Um, but that of course isn't necessarily to say that, that would be the case for all time and, and who knows what the circumstances would be on the day of the poll. Uh, people seem to be increasingly willing to make their minds up about which decision they make on that issue on pragmatic grounds rather than being driven by the, the sort of the old divisions. It, 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 there is a, a bit of a shift in that regard. Some of the young people are not quite as connected into the old identities and therefore could vote in unusual and interesting ways. I'll give you a funny story, a friend of mine from the unionist community uh, was talking to his, his child who's now voting age recently and she said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dad, the first chance I get, I'm going to vote for a United Ireland. And, and he thought, but you've never been political, what, what's going on? You know, what makes you think you would want to vote for a United Ireland coming from our family and so on? And the answer was because on the apple green stores on the way down south, the coffee tastes better. And so I'm going to, I'm going to vote for a United Ireland on that basis. And I think it's, it's quite interesting in a way on an issue in which in the past blood was shed that there are at least some people who might make the decision on such a very, very different grounds. I remember the access to the National Health Service swaying so many moderate Catholics to say, I'd rather remain in the United Kingdom. Practical bread and butter issues like that really, really factored in people's yeah. thinking. I, I, I think also, though, that it is important to say this, that there isn't the same kind of antipathy against either maybe the, the UK or the or the, or or Ireland and the two communities that there used to be. I think I think the world has moved on such a long way. Dublin and Ireland has moved on enormously. The United Kingdom has moved on in ways that that it, it makes it easier for people to, to make a pragmatic judgment than perhaps it would have been in, in, in times past. So we don't know what the outcome of the elections will be, but you can expect a strong Sinn Féin showing, I believe. So just leaving the outcome of the elections um, aside for now, is there a clear process defined for taking the issue of remaining in the UK or joining a United Ireland? Is that process laid out clearly? Do we know what the steps would be once it was initiated? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the provisions of the legislation that put in place the Good Friday Agreement provide for that. Uh, and ultimately, the call would be made on the basis of the evidence available uh, that, a put, that a poll was needed would be made by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. So the UK government minister responsible for, for Northern Ireland would, would make that call. Based on publicly available evidence that... Yes, I mean, obviously, if, if you know, the kinds of evidence would include information from polls, potentially also the actual outcomes of elections and who people were voting for and so on. Uh, and that would, uh, would, would lead, lead the Secretary of State to make 
what he considered to be the appropriate decision at the time. <coughs> Hold the referendum or not. Yeah. Right? And is there then a time frame that's laid out in all, all of that? Um, I think that would all be decided then at that time in terms of just exactly how and the wording and, and so on. A lot of things would have to be determined and presumably lots of consultation and engagement would, would happen. The only thing I want to say before I turn it back over to class is when we lived in Northern Ireland from what, 2001 to 2004, we still send um, young people from Northern Ireland to the United States so they could escape the violence. I remember at one point realizing we were sending kids to Detroit, which was having a terrible summer, <laughs> and that there were four homicides, four in total for 1.7 million people in Northern Ireland. So the murder rate's clearly gone up if you've got one per 100,000. <laughs> It's not, it's not a good place to go if you want to be violently attacked or violently <laughs> It's not a good place to go if you want to be violently attacked. <laughs> Maybe explain, thank you very much. Perhaps explain that to us again. I think most of us believe if Sinn Féin uh, wins the election and uh, is, uh, uh, the first minister comes from Sinn Féin, the party will take an informed decision whether or not it would be wise to call for a referendum because no party obviously wants to lose a referendum. But then it is not in the power of Sinn Féin or the majority of the Assembly to actually call for that referendum? It's, it, well, they can call for it, they can absolutely call for it. Yeah. But the more people that, 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 you know, that are voting for parties that, that are arguing for a united Ireland, then the more evidence there is that perhaps a, poll, a, a, a referendum might be necessary. I, I think the, the, the issue at the moment that, it, that is and maybe it's an issue slightly before then is just the particular election that is coming up has the potential to result in a, a range of different outcomes in terms of the largest party and then the largest designation from which that party comes, which uh, could affect which um, party would be entitled to be first minister as opposed to which party would be entitled to be deputy first minister. And that is likely to be an issue that will be um, debated and discussed first, um, and, and one of the most important ones in order to get the executive and, and the assembly and so on functioning effectively again, that would, could potentially be a big issue. So for example, if Sinn Féin did turn out to be the largest party, uh, but the unionist designation in the assembly became the largest designation and so on, uh, there would be certain rules that would have to be put in place to, uh, to decide who's going to be First Minister, who's going to be Deputy First Minister. To date, it's always been a Unionist in the role of First Minister. And the question is, well, is it possible that next time you know, Sinn Féin will be able to, to nominate the, the First Minister? And this will be a, a change for the, for the first time that a Nationalist could, could be First Minister. Having said that, it's really important to add that the titles, First Minister and Deputy First Minister, are no more than that, and that the two posts are co-equal. So they are both joint first ministers in practice, and that would continue to be the case under the existing legislation. Thank you. Perhaps explain that idea of power sharing executive a little better to us, because that was one of the unique features of the Good Friday Agreement to overcome the troubles. But it's quite unusual when you look at other countries, look at the United States, there's no power sharing going on, is there? Yeah, that's right. So we, the, the key mechanism is a mechanism based on a system uh, invented by a gentleman called De Hond in Belgium, uh, and it essentially means that in proportion to the number of um, um, elected re um, representatives in the assembly, um, each party is entitled to a certain number of ministerial positions. Uh, so after the appointment of the first minister and the deputy first minister, which are the two largest parties, one from each designation, uh, then all the other ministerial posts like education and economy and health and so on are appointed in proportion to the size of the other parties, which results in a spread of ministers from right across the main parties uh, holding office together and having to agree on those issues that require agreement across those boundaries, uh, having to agree a way forward at executive level. It's, it's a very challenging system at times because uh, the parties can come at different topics from, from very different perspectives, but the, the process that they've developed of being able to work together and engage together to find resolutions and ways forward have in themselves been, I think, very effective in building relationships across the parties.
Thank you. At the moment, there is no executive, there is no Northern Ireland government, and it seems, still seems to work quite well. So do we need one? So you're not quite right in saying there's no Northern Ireland government. So as a result of some uh, adaptations to legislation in Westminster, uh, we actually now, for the first time, have caretaker ministers who carry on in most of the key ministerial positions. Uh, and those ministers can make run-of-the-mill uh, decisions and so on until a new uh, executive is agreed and in place. Uh, what they can't do is make any big decisions, they can't make any significant choices uh, that would affect the future of Northern Ireland, so it's really important to get uh, the, new, the new team of um, ministers agreed into position after the election. Right, thank you. When you look at another divided country like Korea, South Korea and North Korea, all the polls, I'm not an expert, but all the polls seem to indicate that South Koreans are actually not all that keen to uh, unify with North Korea for all sorts of reasons, including economic burden and so on. Yeah. What about in the case of Ireland? Are the Irish and the Republic of Ireland all that keen to unify with the Northern Irish, as far as you know? Well, you, you would probably have to ask them. I, I, I mean, the polls do suggest varying levels of support. Um, for, a, for a united Ireland, or at least for a united Ireland in the near future, from the uh, uh, people in, in, in the south of Ireland. Um, I think an awful lot of Irish people do have a dream that one day Ireland will be united. Um, but that, again, probably for pragmatic reasons, doesn't mean that they necessarily always want that to happen the day after tomorrow, if they felt that that might bring problems in its wake and so on. So I guess there's a, a diversity of opinion there and you know people will be very conscious in the in the the Republic of Ireland of the, the strength of their economy and how important it is to have a, a peaceful environment on the island uh, within which um, you know within within which their economy can continue to grow and flourish and that will be a dimension in their thinking as well I guess. Mm -hmm. Please just ask a real basic question about the budget. When I was Consul General, I remember that um, the operating budget to run Northern Ireland was about twice as big as the revenues raised on Northern Ireland, and the difference was made up by Great Britain, by an infusion that came in. Is it now more level, or is this was an issue for people in the Republic, that there's a gap between what is spent in Northern Ireland and what is raised through revenues, and it would have been hard for a small country like Ireland to fill that gap. Yeah, I mean, by and large, Northern Ireland doesn't raise its own revenues at all <coughs> in the sense that all of the monies in the United Kingdom that are collected as taxes, or at least the lion's share of them, are all collected by a single entity in, in London. Uh, and, and then the money is shared out around the United Kingdom. Yeah. And obviously a bit more goes to some regions than to others. Wales, for example, has a particularly challenging economic environment and probably receives the most per capita. Northern Ireland receives a high amount per capita as well, again, because of the historical challenges. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's a reality, um, and it's something that, you know, obviously the, the more we can strengthen the Northern Irish economy, the more we can build new, new kinds of enterprises and get more high, higher paid jobs and so on, and, and uh, look globally in terms of building supply chains and networks and, and so on, and clusters, uh, the more we can begin to punch back and say that we are contributing more and more. But, um, but it is a consequence of the, 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 the history of, of trouble and so on that we haven't been able to do that. But from that point of view, the British taxpayer would be glad to get rid of Northern Ireland. Cost too much. Yeah, the, 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 uh, if, if they stop to think about it like, like that and they, they isolate out one particular part of the country, I suppose, and, and think about it in those terms. But on the other hand, for most of the time, people just assume that it makes sense that the money is spread to those parts of England, Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland that, that most need it. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a question as to whether that's a topic in the, in the media or not, whether or not the, uh, the, the demand for that could be higher or lower. I think the most important thing is reputationally for Northern Ireland to be sending a positive image of itself, not just in the United States and, and elsewhere around the globe, but also uh, within the United Kingdom and Ireland as well. It, it needs to have a, a more positive image and it needs to work harder probably to dispel those occasional headlines that send maybe a distorting message about what the place is like and the degree to which there is trouble at the moment. Thanks a lot. Tell us about your own job in Washington, D.C. 
because it's a unique job, you know, and no other country, as far as I'm aware of, has a similar job like the one you occupy. So there is also a Scottish representative, but he or she is based in the British Embassy, while you are fairly independent. You are like the ambassador of Northern Ireland to the United States. Well, that's a very nice way to think about it, but it, it, it's not quite like that. So I, I get my um, diplomatic identity from the, the British ambassador. That's, that's the only way under the international rules that govern these things that I can be <coughs> diplomat in, in, in the United States. Um, it, it isn't a unique role. Uh, the Northern Ireland executive has a post in Brussels, one which I occupied before coming here, which is the same status. It has a uh, post in, in Beijing, which is the same status. Um, and in fact, in Brussels, the, the Scottish and the Welsh governments also have their representatives in a, a out house from the from the British Embassy uh, there. So, so there is there is precedent for that elsewhere. Um, I think. Uh, you know, it is important, I think, in positioning Northern Ireland internationally, and particularly in the United States, to have a keen eye to the, that thing I talked about earlier, where people in Northern Ireland can view themselves as British, or can view themselves as Irish, or as both. And that's all, that's all good. That's, that's all fine, and it's totally accepted under the Constitution. You can have an Irish passport, you can have a British passport, or you can have both. And I think there, it is important in the positioning of Northern Ireland overseas that we reflect the, that spread of identity that you find in Northern Ireland, that spread of identity that I find among my ministers. I mean, it is, it is amazing when you think about it that, you know, at one and the same time I'm working for British Unionist ministers and Irish Republican ministers who once upon a time would have seen each other maybe as bitter enemies and yet now they're collaborating and working together. It, it, it makes me very proud when I stop and think of that, that we've been able to achieve that in, in, in Northern Ireland. Not very good. No, I was thinking of other countries rather than the UK. You know, the Bavarian, there's no Bavarian representative in Brussels or Texas representative in Brussels as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But I did get to know the, the heads of the German lender very well. They were extremely effective in positioning their, and uh, making their case in, in Brussels in, in those days. I'm sure they are. <laughs> Will we take questions from the yeah. audience? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's uh, begin with that. Please. Me? Yes. Okay. Short question, please. Oh, huh. Well, polls show Sinn Féin is on course to become the largest party in Northern Ireland and in response to unionist parties, the UP and UUP have refused to say that they'll cooperate with Sinn Féin. Are you concerned that unionists won't cooperate with Sinn Féin if Sinn Féin wins the post of first minister? Um, well, we don't know yet what will happen after the election. People are in campaign mode at the moment. They're seeking votes. They're making their cases. There are, there are certain issues, and some of the issues I talked about, like the protocol and so on, where people are positioning themselves. Uh, after the election is all over and the dust is settled and so on, people will go back into negotiations, and uh, I, I've no doubt at all that they'll find a way through uh, finding a new way of of continuing to work together and, and uh, several of the, the unionist politicians that I've heard have said in, in the course of the election campaign already how important it is that the working together carries on and that the, the, the sharing government carries on. You are optimist. I am not. Good. <laughs> uh, uh, any more questions please? Yes please. This is the other gentleman here. Um, so um, Sam Cornock. I am an economics major here at UNC. Um, my question relates to the um, increase in um, support for um, anti-European Union nationalism um, throughout Europe and how that might affect the stability of the um, peace between Northern Ireland and the UK. So, I mean, it's, 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 there, there has always been a long tradition of various groups being concerned about the European project, the direction in which it was taking us in the early days. Quite often those concerns were expressed more on the left than they were on the right. Um, more recently, perhaps, the right has featured more prominently in the uh, opposition to, to the European project, and there are different factors at play in that. What I would say is that 
yes, it's a risk. Uh, and yes, there are certain countries in Europe that have elected governments that don't fit well into the European project in various ways. But there are very different situations as you go from country to country. So if you look at the Orban situation, for example, in Hungary, it's not at all like the situation in Poland, although there are some similarities. And again, it's different again when you, for example, compare and contrast the anti-Europeanism in the UK with anti-Europeanism in France. So it, it, it's something nationalism and, and, and its relationship with the European Union is it, it's, it's a, a balancing act that the European institutions have been working on for a very long time. They've become rather good at managing it. Um, but it, it, it's always a question that, you know, once they introduced Article 50, which I think was in the Lisbon Treaty, if I remember correctly, that actually, I mean, what, what, what those people who wanted to leave the European Union and the UK proved was that they could leave the, the, the mechanisms of the European Union facilitated it. So in a sense, in, 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 in that search for sovereignty and to the worry that sovereignty was lost, they were able to demonstrate again that actually the sovereignty, in, in that sense, that ultimate sense of being able to walk away was there and it's there for other countries too. At present, I would say that the single market and, and also the experience of Brexit probably are things that would keep a lot of the countries that are currently in the European Union wanting to stay in the European mm. Union. Do you fear if there is um, a Le Pen vi a victory in the French election that uh, Frexit might happen? <laughs> so, um, I think if, if I, I mean, I have been following very closely, but I think she's not proposing to leave the European Union. I think that her campaign message doesn't include that. I think what she's saying she wants to do is challenge from within. And so I think it would just become another challenge for the institutions and for the countries collectively and the council and the commission and elsewhere to be able to work through those challenges and, 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 and deal with it. it. There's no doubt that a country the size of France certainly could be very disruptive if it was um, if, if the actual outworkings of that were, were to challenge the, all of the fundamentals of the, of the European um, project. But uh, that remains to be seen, and I think it is interesting that you know that, the, that her party has moved away from the position that it took a few years back when it was saying, I think at, at one point that Brexit was something it would contemplate. Maybe Brexit frightened them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can we answer more questions? Um, Brian here over there. Well, thank you. Your talk was masterful, a wonderful review of history, so thank you very much. It was a grand tour of, uh, <coughs> of uh, Ireland, which you gave us. Uh, also, you masterfully avoided the questions uh, on your left about what was going to happen, so I have to commend you on that. That was very good. <laughs> well, uh, this young man, Aidan, uh, asked you something, and I'm most curious, uh, when do you think, or do you think it's going to happen uh, that they will come together as one country? Uh, can I put that in my calendar for years ahead? What do you, is this going to happen? That's the, the politicians in Northern Ireland? No, are we, going to have, are we going to have a one country island in your lifetime, in his lifetime? So, I mean, the constitution of Northern Ireland, as it were, provides for it. It can, it can happen. Will it? It's really just a question of whether people choose to want it enough that they actually vote for it. And I think it's entirely possible that it could happen, but it's also entirely possible that people could choose otherwise. It's not a, it's not a, it's, it's not a sure thing, but it is something that certainly could, I, I could easily imagine a set of circumstances that would lead in that direction, or indeed a set of circumstances that wouldn't. Which, which way are you going to bet? <laughs> which way are you going to bet? Are you going to put your money 50, uh, is it 50-50? Is it 75-25? I would be loath to actually put a figure on it. <laughs> <laughs> I might kind of get this far later, I might tell you something more, but I'll, I'll, I'll not go there, I think, uh, at this particular moment in the electoral fortunes of the world. 
<laughs> you're not a gambling man. Then. <laughs> Any more questions? There was another question. Over there, the passive place. Hi, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us today. Um, so my question is on the kind of, uh, as you touched on, the legal process of potential um, a referendum in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm curious if you're actually, um, if you're confident that the, um, and forgive me, I, I don't know too much about the specifics of the Good Friday Agreement, but are you really confident that a uh, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland um, that is from a major UK party that are all, you know, you, that are both strongly unionists, um, would they actually allow for a referendum if the political tides swing in Northern Ireland in the way that, I'm just thinking comparatively in the way that I don't think any conservative government would allow for a second uh, independence referendum in Scotland, regardless of the continued SNP majority in, in uh, Scotland. So I'm wondering if the um, legal arrangements are different. Um, do you think this could create a different um, like interest in Northern Irish Irish politics becoming more involved in UK politics. Um, so yeah, that's kind of. So I, I don't think anyone really actively interested in thinking about how to achieve a referendum or indeed how to prevent a referendum, depending on what position they take on it and so on. Really, very often thinks about it in terms of the immediate Secretary of State that might be in post at a particular moment in time. So different secretaries of state come and go, different governments in Westminster come and go. And really, it's, it's, it's more a question of thinking maybe in a slightly longer time frame, you know, the number of years that will be involved, for example, even from perhaps the first idea that it might happen to it actually ha happening and then the change happening. I think a much bigger question probably is the whole question of, you know, one of the experiences of Brexit was that issue of not being ready for the consequence of the vote having gone the way that it went and all the, the problems that that created and, and maybe the issue is really that you know I, I'm not sure that either part of Ireland would particularly want to be bounced with something that they had to sort of magically make happen overnight but actually the change process would have to be you know very carefully thought through so I think that's an issue I think far more important than the question of you know, whether there's a United Ireland or the likelihood of it, or whether people remain in the UK or the likelihood of it, is that people become comfortable with the possibilities and the freedom they have to choose those possibilities in Northern Ireland. So in other words, the, the, the way in which people felt at the time when I talked about my relative, you know, when Ireland was being freshly partitioned, and that sense of maybe local injustice about who was ending up where and what side of the border and so on. That was an angry time. That was a time when people were just torn apart from each other. We built a time now because people see the possibility that they can have what they want politically to happen someday. They can see that there's no barrier to it. And it's about reassuring people that their rights and that their sense of identity and so on are are, are a lot freer than they once were. That is the thing that has done a lot of good in Northern Ireland. So for me, it's about the possibility. People need to be able to look from whatever, whether they feel themselves to have Irish identity, British identity, or both, and they want to be able to see the possibilities for them and for their families and so on, that they can potentially realize them. And I think that's what's great about what was achieved in the Good Friday Agreement, rather than the actual outcome that you might someday get one thing or another. You know. Thank you. But if there were a referendum, and if the referendum went toward unity, is there other specification about the process? I'm sure it would not happen overnight. There might be two years, three years, or six months, I don't know. Are these specifications laid down somewhere or not? There's, there would be a, a lot of work needed on the detail of that. There are one or two things about how it would be done, but it, they, they would be open to a lot of legal interpretation. The, the main issue at the moment is that I think it, it's 50% plus one uh, that would determine the outcome, and um, that, you know, that, that's um, me, that, then the, the question just then of how you, for example, for, for the winning side, you know, for example, where to have to be United Ireland, how you, how you, how you manage that process in a way that, that recognises that Northern Ireland has evolved in a particular way, the Republic of Ireland has evolved in another way, which is very different. For example, we talk about a health service free at the point of delivery versus a system based on insurance. 
um, salaries are massively different in the two in, in the two uh, parts of the island and so on. It, you know, to actually do it in a way that wouldn't actually make life really difficult for a whole lot of people would it would seem to me to be the important thing, and yet also to be able to show responsiveness to the way in which the electorate have decided to vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Yeah. So on that topic, um, I was I recall that there was some consultation between the South Africans in Truth and Reconciliation and the Irish uh, way back when in the day. And uh, I'm wondering whether you see a model from the Irish stability of their difficulties with South Africa, maybe with Yugoslavia, with um, Israel, Palestine, um, and, and other endemic conflicts, maybe even in this country. <laughs> That's my question. It's very good. I mean, one of one of the um, aspects of the Northern Irish conflict that I was quite heavily involved in, actually at the point in my career whenever Barbara was in Northern Ireland, uh, was in relation to the management of parades and processions. And there'd been a lot of conflict around parades and processions, especially parades by the loyal orders, the Orange Order and others, uh, that were being increasingly opposed by groups of people from an Irish nationalist perspective who lived in areas that the traditional parade had always gone through and they were becoming offended by it or concerned by it or various different circumstances in different places. Um, and it was a great deal of um, conflict and, and challenge in trying to find resolutions to those problems. Um, and I got together with a, a South African lawyer called Brian Curran, who had been appointed to try to resolve one of the biggest conflicts in a place called Drumcree in, in, in Port of Down. And, 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 and we, we worked together on taking groups of people from Northern Ireland close to the conflict uh, to South Africa, and there spending time with people who had engaged with each other in terms of finding ways through the South African conflict. And uh, that was a very powerful thing that we did and it, it uh, uh, some good stories about that time in terms of you know I can remember one one particular uh, group that we brought over um, one of the people going on the trip came to me and, and these people were drawn from right across the community so there were people there including people close to the paramilitaries and uh, people in the orange order people in um, in, in um, nationalist and republican groups and so on and uh, one of them came to me and said, look, can I just tell you now, Andrew, that I'm coming on this trip, but I don't want you ever to have me seated next to him. <laughs> so that was the kind of you know, stuff that was, was coming at me when, when it, the trip was being organized. I was saying, look, you know, South Africa, the bush could only be, I'll do my best, but I won't give you any guarantees. <laughs> on, the, on the first uh, return journey, um, we were in Heathrow, and the Met Police basically approached two people from the group and took them out of the group and held them. They weren't going to be able to fly on back to Belfast. Um, fortunately, from my perspective, the, the two people who were held, one was a loyalist, one was a Republican, so there was balance in what had happened. <laughs> what was really interesting about the thing for me was that the entire group of about 20 people came to me and said, we're not leaving here until our friends are able to join us. And then the conflict was with me, because I was the accounting officer for the money for the whole trip. <laughs> and I knew that if they didn't fly back to Belfast, I had this huge problem with my hands about getting new flights for them and so on. So it was a big negotiation resulted with me versus the rest. And in the end, I got, I think, every, everyone bar one other person who we agreed would stay behind to support these two chaps who'd been, who'd been held. Because they would get their flights paid for once they were eventually released by the Met Police. So it was a very interesting experience, having gone from a situation where people didn't want to sit next to each other to a situation where there was total unanimity about wanting to be there for each other because they've got to know each other as human beings. Very powerful thing. And it's sometimes easier to do that and to achieve that by going somewhere else and by looking at someone else's conflict because it's hard to be objective about your own conflict. You're really too caught up in it. So if you start off by establishing some principles about somewhere else in the world, in turn, then that can make it easier then to look back at your own conflict with those principles. Thanks very much. 
There was a question here, yeah, this gentleman. Um, given that um, Northern Ireland currently exists in a sort of sweet spot economically, would uh, voting to reunify with Ireland cost it economically? Um, it, it, it's impossible to say. Um, it, would, it would certainly be costs associated with the change, um, but it's impossible to predict the future in that kind of way. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's been doing well. There are potentially opportunities if we can sort out the, the, the remaining challenges with the protocol and so on for Northern Ireland to do very well out of the compromise uh, that's been agreed through that. Um, but as to whether or not um, a united Ireland would lead to a delay before there was greater GDP per capita or whatever, but it, 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 it's just, there's, there are too many unknowns for me to really attempt to answer that question at all. It, it, we would have to do, we'd have to see what happened. And, and really, ultimately, the most important thing is just keep on saying it's for the people to choose. And that was the big and precious thing that we established in the in the Good Friday Agreement. But the people are emotional, so it will depend on the emotion of the day. <coughs> we, we want all of the people to choose, including the emotional ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There was a question over here, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm John Young. And John Young is the Honorary Consul of the Republic of Ireland here. It's the probability of a bridge between Northern Ireland and Scotland. <laughs> Wasn't that proposed? It certainly, yes, there, there was a proposal a while back for um, a bridge. Um, and I seem to recall maybe a few months ago that the results of an initial study into the feasibility of it came in uh, and it basically um, made it very unlikely that it would happen. So I think there were challenges and costs and so on identified that meant that that wouldn't be seen as a way forward. So, uh, yeah, I think, the, I, I'm not too sure that that's a live proposal any longer. And I would like to thank you for a very interesting and stimulating <laughs> talk. some very challenging question as well, and particularly to Aidan for asking the best question of the evening, <laughs> which you did not answer properly. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, Crossbow events will be back in the fall, um, and hopefully you will join us again probably in early September, sometime like that, and we will have some more exciting events lined up. Probably not quite as exciting as our event tonight, who could compete, but thank you again, Andrew Elliott, for coming to see us tonight, and thank you for coming. Thank you.